you are now live. Hello? We're live. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Hi everybody. It is Thursday, June the 3rd, in the year of our Lord 2021. Which Lord that is, I don't know. Um, that's not um, anti-Christian or anything, that's just a, you know, anyway, before I dig a deeper hole. Um, great, I'm going to pull Johnny in, because without further ado, you don't want to hear me waffling on, so I'm going to pull Johnny in right now. Okay, see all. Where is it? I'm going to, hang on a sec. I'm going to, hang on a sec. Here we go. Low, 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 low. Okay, where's... Well, um, hang on a sec. As you can tell, I'm not very up on this. I'm going to... There we go. Here we go. Let me. Let's get the man on. Johnny. Hi, Red. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, good. All right. I'm enjoying this weather. Yeah, it's it's all right in Manchester. It's been it's been tropical for a few days, so everyone's losing their minds. Obviously, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you great. I can hear you great. How you do? I mean, have you fi have you finished the record? Yeah, yeah. I finished. I finished it about like, about a week ago because when we last spoke you just you said um you had like uh like one lyric or one riff or something right yeah it was driving me crazy yeah it yeah it, it was a it was a line yeah that you know how it is you know, yeah when just... did when when did it come to you was it like when you weren't thinking about it or was it did it just drop it, of course it came to me at like three o'clock in the morning of course <laughs> while i was supposed to be asleep honestly seriously <laughs> seriously why 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 does that happen but um uh, I, m most of it's been that way to be honest yeah. with you. it's been back to being kind of my nocturnal ways almost on the last sort of couple of albums i've been living pretty nocturnally and i said hey listen this is no this is no life for an, an adult <laughs> you know <laughs> And uh, this is, you know, living like like a dead one. I was, a, I was going to say a student, but anyway, you know what I mean. I and, do. Um, uh, so, uh, but it just seems to go that way, really, for me. Like, I don't know. I don't try. I just, I just kind of. I, I think it's better when there's no static around. And yeah. There's. It's not just a matter of like your brain waves slowing yeah. down. It's just there's too much static in the air these days. So it kind of comes to me, a lot of good ideas come to me in the night, I think. I totally agree with you. There's so much noise in the daytime, literally. All, and you think of that, all the frequencies going off, there's a stillness to the night that um, that's when the stuff happens, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's been that way for me on the last few albums. So, yeah. you know, I've got, uh, you know, you think you're asleep and you're not really, and then you just wake up and go, pow! You got it's, it. You know, yeah, put it. You know, honestly, I had this thing with on the last <laughs> album, the, the, the track, The Tracers, and um, it was just, it was called Tracers for a long time, like months, because I, I, uh, I had that title and the concepts and all of that quite a while before I started doing that record. And honestly, man, it was like half five in the morning, I just woke up thinking, I had this major revelation, it should be The Tracers. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, sent the, I sent a text to myself, and I went... <laughs> sort of eventually got back to sleep. And often when we're doing a festival or whatever, and I, I look at it on the set list, I go, that was a good move. <laughs> the traces is a big, it's a big difference. But you know, it's funny because that's the, one of the things, you'll know this because you've written a lot more ly lyrics than I have, but that's one of the things getting to grips with trying to write lyrics that you really notice that it, one word can completely shift your feeling about something, can't it? I mean. That for me is like, that was the big revelation about trying to write a lyric was like, you look at something, you go, I like the feeling of this, but this feels really, really dodgy. And then you just change one word or you change it or you take a U out or you take an I out or something. And suddenly it's like, oh, that's better. Do you know what I mean? The, um, the, the lyric that was driving me mad. Yeah. I, I changed 
and for cos. <laughs> Apostrophe, C-O-S. And for a few days when I talked to you, it was the most important word in yeah. the English language. Wow. And, and the and. So, I mean, seriously, that, that happened. That, that was the last thing I changed. Uh, wow. And. and and then on another one of the choruses, I think it said uh, then or something. And both times, yeah. I was so happy because cause, because yeah. better's going to come was a lyric. It was yeah. and better's going to come. Yeah. And in the context, exactly yeah. as you're talking about, because yeah. better's going to come, explained the whole yeah. sentiment of the, of the previous three, three lines that, that make the chorus. Yeah. And, um, and it made it less try and it made it more, more sincere and all of it. And, um, but this is why... You know, songwriting, um, particularly with words, um, you know, it isn't poetry. There's, a, there's a, a lot of misunderstandings that people who don't write songs have about songwriting, I think, um, which is, you know, that there's this mi mistaken idea that the more profound and the more, uh, and the more authentic, the better it is, just by yeah. virtue of the fact that it's authentic and profound. But... Spellbound by Susie and the Banshees or, you know, uh, Boys Don't Cry by The Cure or Fascination Street. Yeah. I wouldn't want it to be called anything else. No. Yeah, I don't want... St some songs I don't want the opening verse to be profound. Yeah. You know, Take Me Out, Franz Ferdinand. You don't want some yeah. the exposition about Alex's inner world. You no. want it to do the same with the music. I mean, you know that. And that's, that's one of the great... Parts of part of the Rubik cube that is the craft of songwriting. I think it's so it's fantastic. Sometimes, you know, I've had songs which is the reverse of what I've just said. Where I'd particularly with you know my own stuff, where um, say a song like "Hi Hello," which there was a sincerity in the music and a an emotive emotive quality in the music that would had I written something about you know. A building or which I've done before or, or society or, or whatever uh, it would have been pretentious I yeah. need to honor the spirit yeah. of the music so that's yeah. one one bit of the Rubik's Cube but then as I've said the another part of it is this thing where if something is is very beautiful it's so say this song uh, I've said this before but with the song that I've written called Armatopia the fact that the lyrics are very serious it's an eco song yeah I deliberately wrote to a kind of banging kind of party backing track because to have written something that was you know that sounded like you know um i've been out in a cabin for the last sort of year and and with my acoustic something very earnest it just would have been it would have over egged it yeah so the all of these considerations are what keep you up at night uh but when but when you crack it it's fantastic. And then some other things, as you know, just pour out and they're just great. And you go, where the hell did that come from? But it's all of the above. It's never, a lot of people think you have this idea that you come down, you descend down your staircase <laughs> in your bathrobe. And you sit which you do piano, sometimes. Which you know I do, yeah. <laughs> and you, you, you sit looking wistfully out onto your lawn at the piano or with your acoustic guitar and yeah. you emote. I mean, if you want to make music that, sounds like Gary Barlow then be my guest you know <laughs> Gary Barlow lives in next village next to my mum well ask him anyway. well, ask him where, he, where I can get a good dressing gown I might, right. write some, I might make some more money <laughs> you know what I you know what I because I listened to you you sent me the tracks and I'm not going to mention any names because I know I'm not allowed to well, um, I, but I know I you like to... well I, I'm really glad that you like lightning people that was really cool. This is an exclusive on your... On your... I, do you know what? It's funny, like, I listened to it when you sent it through a couple of days ago, and I listened to the six tracks, and I think I mentioned another one. And then today it was just like, bang, it really came out. And you know what? It struck me. You're doing... You, it struck me you, in the lyrics and what you're doing in the song. You're capturing a spirit. That's what I get. I get this... Like, what you're trying to do is, like, bottle light. I really feel like that. And it's like that spirit of, and I really, really relate to that because, you know, there's some on my record, which is very much that same spirit. It's that kind of, it's, it's, it's like a William Blake thing. It's a, yeah. like, it's a feeling, isn't it? And that's, that's really hard to do. I, th I mean, I found, I found that quite hard to do. But man, you completely did it. And I totally, I, 
I mean, it's so strong. It's so strong, which I want to get onto again, because it baffles me how you can keep doing this. But you, <laughs> you honestly, it's like, and it's so you as well. It's completely authentic. Thanks, you know. Ed. That's very, well, you know, you're, I think you're one of the four people who've heard it. Uh, uh, so that means, obviously that means a lot because you're in this, uh, not just because you like it and you, because you get it but, yeah. um, and, and, and it's positive, but um, you know what it's like, especially now in this situation we're in, where you, how are we going to get feedback? So yeah. you, you're in this weird kind of, I used to like, for, for so many years, I used to love this place where you'd finish the record and it's not yet out and it's just for you and your mates in the Smiths days. Oh man, I don't know whether you had that experience, but yeah. it was like this great secret that you yeah. that you just couldn't wait to put out. But you had this little kind of period where it was just yours, and you'd be playing it in your house. And um, that well, was I did great, that. Do you but... remember when I did that when we finished in Rainbows? We literally finished mixing, and I drove straight up to Manchester to play it to you because I was like so proud of this record that we made, and I wanted to play it to you. And I because you know you because you let or lent us all those guitars as well. But I yeah. was just like, it's, it is a magic moment when you, when you think, when you've got something that you, you can't, you think is people are going to really like as well, or you hope they do, but you really love it and you want to share it. it is, it's a magical moment, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I think these, maybe because I've been gigging so much or because I, I don't know, I must have changed or I don't know whether, you know, it, um, what it is, maybe it's because it's my own, I'm the front man now and all of that, but I kind of, um, now I, I now I want it out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I just want it out now. You know that that's that obvious. It's that's real kind of your cliche thing of when you do. You know, a painter wants for it to be shown. You know. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's because I I don't have like fifteen people sitting around on the carpet smoking pot. Smoking dope. I might, I, I need to get them back. <laughs> they, hey, then I don't give a shit. <laughs> But, but that's also part of the thing, isn't it? About, it's different. The solo thing is different from being a band because the band it is about a gang of sorts. It is about yeah. a, a kind of co inner cabal and then you have it to the out and then you've got, you know, that's part of the, you know, it's, I think also probably because if you're in a band, it's gone through the filter of, you know, the four or five of you plus the producer engineer. And if you're, if you're all raving about it, then you know that, it's it's got something i think it's a lot harder <clears throat> i've only done this once obviously but i think it's a lot harder when you're on your own because you know yeah it's just it's a no, different dynamic some, that, that hadn't occurred to me i think i think there's something in that yeah um that that's right i think i was suddenly talking i did a podcast with someone today and they're asking me about some what things have changed and i all i always had this one of my you know this sort of consistent mantra which was that i made in the Smiths days and with the, the uh, I guess with Modest Mouse as well, the Cribs, the, we, um, I felt like I first was making music for myself. As soon as I hit the track, uh, and I had the track together, that, and the idea, but then I was making it for the band, and then it was the fans. Uh, that was the main consideration. And then the media, they were definitely, you, you knew they were going to be there, but they were, they were at the bottom of the pile, but they were there. Yeah. And, um, but um, but now I'm not, I find that I'm kind of I think uh, once I'm I think I've got a good idea with the last couple of albums I'm not just saying it I th I'm making it for the fans first yeah the band can fuck off but <laughs> uh, they'll like it they'll but, like it if I, I love say the, so the, 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 I love the band yeah, uh, I know. but they, they um, no but I'm making it the the fans you know are really uh, because I like, I like, my, I really like my audience. I've yeah. got, that's the thing over the last, it sounds like a, a bit of a strange thing to say perhaps, but uh, it's been like eight years of this building up this relationship. And I feel like, you know, I feel kind of like a, I sort of got their vibe and they kind of got mine. And, you know, we kind of, you know, we, we, we sort of, you know, we dress alike and we think alike and we read the same kind of things. And I think, and so anyway, they're on my mind more of the last couple of yeah. albums. They, they were always on my mind, but they're, they're they're more to the front now, I think. So, because of this situation and not being able to get out, no, we're go we're gigging yet. I'm a little frustrated that I won't get out to play to play. It, but hey, uh, join the yeah. queue, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I can only vouch for that 
the gig at the Roundhouse in 2019 when Susan and I came along. And it was the, it was the best gig I went to that year. The vibe was, you know, the, you've, got, you've got all the songs, but yeah. the vibe and stuff is amazing. So no, it's good. been great. It's been, that was a great night. Polly Proper. came and... and yeah, um, and Matt, Matt, Matt Johnson. Matt, Matt Johnson, yeah. I was a little yeah. bit starstruck when I met Jack, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're all right, but Matt Johnson. Yeah. It was funny. It was. It was. It was. It. It. Yeah. It was great. It was great. Me. It was a good night, Ed. It was, it was so, a great night. So, what are you doing? Are you writing then? Well, I. I told you last. I told you last time. I, I've been in. A, I've been in a bit of a hole. Um, but I have to say, today, what I've been trying. I'm. 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 I'm trying to find. A, I've been trying to find my way in. And I wanted to actually ask you about this because for me, it's all about, so I've written some stuff, no, no, no lyrics, but I have an idea lyrically in my head where I want to go. But for me, it's always, well, for me, I say it's always, it's only been the last eight, 10 years. It's starting with the music and the top line usually appears in that. And it's usually, I, I have a feeling, I know what I want to, and it's usually sounds. And then the sounds morph into words, and that's how I always yeah. I say it's a bit like archaeology. It's a bit like, or one of those kits the kids used to get, like at a birthday party, where you scrape away a piece of chalk and you suddenly see a skeleton there or something. You know what I mean? It's that thing of yeah. like it, with yeah. lyrics for me. It's a bit like brush it. There's it's I have this thing that I have this thing like the song is fully formed. It's out there, and my job is to tune into that and to scrape yeah. it away and my intuition is my guide so so i've been really i've been really struggling because i i spent uh you know first four months of this year you know really applying myself doing that thing of getting down at 10 o'clock in the morning doing it going through till three or whatever and but i just wasn't connecting with anything and i've been in a hole so but today um, today, I, I think I found the start of the trail, which was, oh, right. which it's a sound and it's a sound and it's the first time that, yeah, it's, so I feel like for me, it's about getting the palette. Yeah. The way, well, I don't think you're alone in that. I think yeah. quite a few people, as, uh, with the sounds thing, I mean, when you say sounds in terms of the voice, in terms of your tunes, your words, you're talking like phonetics and no it's about literally it's about how what's the what's the musical palette what's the sound going to be so uh -huh. you know i've got i've got the synths i've got the i've got the juno the old juno and i've been playing with the arpeggio arpeggiator on that and stuff like that but i haven't i i keep on coming back to the guitar and yeah. i found uh so i you know i told i texted you about that boss looper yeah so that boss yeah. looper which is, I found that. And then that, that, that voice three live extreme, that TC Helicon, this, I know I'm getting a bit uh, nerdy here, which is great for vocal harmonies. But the other thing that I had today was a, an old uh, harmonizer, an eventide, you know that eventide delay that you have, the timeline, time factor? Yeah. They do one called a pitch factor. Yeah. And I've yeah. had it for 11 years and I've never used it. Is that the and green I, one or the blue one or something? It's the red one. Okay, right. It's the red one. And I've never blue... used it either. And I picked it up. It's too complicated. <laughs> I know that's. <laughs> they do too much. Oh, and tell well, me about it. That's man, if you can't crack it, then yeah, none well, of us can crack it. No, well, I honestly, it's been on my shelf for 11 years and I pulled it out. And for whatever reason, the sound is perfect. It wasn't 11 years ago, but there's something about the sound of it that just pulled me in and I started playing with it and it's great. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just at the start of it and I. I you know, you're at the end of a cycle and you have been writing. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I, I read that. I read I read the article, that interview that you gave in that songwriters thing. And the thing that really struck me was, well, I know what I want to ask you. Do you. How do you know when you're ready to write? I mean, you're not writing songs all the time, are you or are you? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, you are, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, wow, yeah, bits and bits, yeah. And I think, you know, I'll be honest, at the end of this, now I've done this record, there's two ways to go one is to 
either go and sit under a palm tree, literally go and sit under a palm tree, or, or in your mind do the equivalent and switch off. Yeah. Which, um, which I have done in the past, you know, I mean, uh, uh, not often, but I, I have done. Me, Bernard Sumner and myself, I would drive Bernard mad because when we finished the electronic albums, because Bernard's really into sailing, He's a, and that's his passion. And we would go out on a boat and he would, he, I've just found myself in the middle of the Mediterranean or in the, you know, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And, and, and I'd still be all buzzing about the record, but that would really, being around him, and he was very, very zen about that, like really slowing down. So I, I was able to, that was my experience of switching off. But uh, as, I know it's probably a good idea for my, my mental health and the mental health of everyone around me if I switch off, but I think I'm going to try... I'm going to try, you know, stay on a roll, stay, I, I, I'm not going to be, you know, uh, living completely nocturnally, but I'm going to, I'm going to try keeping the writing, the writing up because I don't want the, the gears can sort of kind of rust over a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that it sounds, it sounds incredibly kind of like a moan and it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean to be, it doesn't mean to be a moan, but what, what, one of the things that people don't, maybe don't realize it happens so much when you have success, when you're, you know, blessed and lucky enough to have people want to be interested in you, is that the promotion and the the, the talking and the the all the stuff of promoting it, uh, which you have to do for a number of reasons to honour the work aside from anything else and to you know pay everyone's mortgages and all of that. Um, you know, you you uh, it takes you away from from the space, the mental space of being really creative all the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, some people, most people I know just can't write on tour. I tend to not be able to because I'm just, frankly, just because I'm so busy, but I know that yeah. I can because the second album, Playland, I deliberately wrote ar around festivals and on the bus and we recorded that. The biggest song I've had for 25 years myself easy money was written on and recorded on the tour bus wow uh, we, we put the drums on afterwards <clears throat> the vocal everything the guitars the bass wow. all done on, on the bus so i know i can do it but to answer your question i sort of uh, i intend to uh, yeah be right be writing all the time i intend to have you ever had moments when you have have you ever had moments when you have you've you've just nothing's come out or what you've you've written you haven't connected with yeah, I've had times when I've written a load of music that I, I've just not connected with. But I think archaeology is a good way of putting it. I think that's why some artists are crazy. A lot, a lot of artists are crazy because they have, if they're lucky, artists have this idea of perfection. Mm. And they will keep on going until they find this perfection. Now, I'm not saying all, I think all my songs are perfect, but you I have was. this idea. You have this idea, Ed, right? you have this, uh, you know, you're pursuing a track, yeah. even with the songs that I was writing with other people, Morrissey or Kirstie or Matt or whatever. Um, and let's, let's put it this way, someone watching the process and watching you in a studio cutting a track, they would hear you do the track, seven hours later, they'd go, why are they still working on it? Yeah. Why did they just change that? It sounded pretty good to me. Two days later, why are they still doing the track? I mean, your band, famous for it. Why? Why have, why have they come back three months later and changed this arrangement? It's actually, you know, I mean, the story that I know about um, everything in its right place is a great example. Yeah. And, there's, and the stuff you told me about, you know, OK Computer and many people, fans even, will be watching that process and going, they've nailed it. Why are they pulling their hair out five, day, five days later? And the artists are crazy because you have this idea of, perfection or mm. or um i've realized the promise that i was looking for i've mm. realized it yeah. and you cannot rest until you realize it yeah uh, and it, on, on the face of it it seems like peculiar behavior even on a more micro level sitting around uh on day one of getting a drum sound together yeah I mean, most people who think they want to be in the music industry <laughs> they want to do that for a few albums <laughs> And, do you uh, know what it's? It, yeah. Do you know it's funny? Sorry to interrupt you, but what I think is amazing about music is, and you you tapped on it there, when a song is in its infancy, like when it's just you know when you get that spark, what I find it that that magic that you you realise in that moment that 
the potential, right? You feel yeah. the potential. And I think that is, and there's so much power in that. You need that right at the start to pull you through, like you said, all those cul-de-sacs, meanderings, all those things to come back. You, it, it's, it is about realizing the potential because it's like, I don't even think it's a mental thing. It's a feeling, isn't it? Or you might hear it in your head, potential of, it's much easier when, it's you, when you're writing it, you're writing the lyrics. But it's, it is an amazing thing that you, you it's, it is magic. It's a kind of, it's like yeah. alchemy. Yeah. And then, you know, the finishing it, uh, you know, um, the, the promise is, that's a good word that you use there. It is so uh, exciting. Yeah. And then, hey, listen, I, uh, I actually think that uh, I've got no problem with the concept of craft. No. Because you and I have been, you know, I know when you, when you started out, you played a lot of sh little gigs, a lot of gigs to very few people. And you had, you, you had the van and, and that's, uh, that's got to count for something. Um, I'm proud that I did that. I'm proud that the Smiths did that. And, um, and then I'm proud that we went through, uh, all of us collectively, the pressure of album two of Me Is Murder. That was, a lot, that was a lot of pressure. It went to number one. And in the UK... What was, what was, what was the, sorry, what was the pressure on that? Was the pressure following well, the pressure up what was, you'd done? For me, was the, well, the pressure was because from the minute Hand in Glove came out, yeah. a lot of the world we were in, which was the music press and alternative... Uh, culture, let's say student culture, just immediately said, we're like, these guys are the second coming. Yeah. And unless you're a complete egomaniac, you kind of go, oh, shit. Uh, you know, we, we knew we were good and I believed in us, but we would only had like nine songs. Yeah. And then, and then the first album did well. Uh, and the trajectory, we were being blown up, you know, blown up. I mean, in your case, I guess, you know, following it's very up, different, but following up the Benzo, you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, um, but we did, it was, I think it was really different. You guys had that amazing, you, you were amazing out of the blocks. We were like really slow out of the blocks, apart from like, maybe we had a, a, a good start, a full start with creep, but it was, we, yeah, I mean, we were like, we were like the slow burners, if you like, whereas you guys were like, you had the pressure because you were the coolest band. In it was a, yeah, it was good. For and, us the and, and the best music as well. You well, were the best. Thank you. Well, well, it was, you know, we felt like that was being put on us and we had to live up to that. Yeah. And, you know, but, did, you know, that wasn't easy, but we did it. And I'm very proud of all of us for doing that. But that is all part, when I say craft, I include that. Yeah. I include the pressure uh, and you know we didn't just I didn't just waltz into the Queenie's Dead and go hey well, this is going to be legendary step back everybody this is going to be <laughs> this is, just wait a just sec give, give me this some room made. give me some room uh, come <laughs> and see me in 12 weeks time and it, you know no. and, you know, I, uh, you know I was kind of like all the way through that record I was like what's that Food, what's that? Sleep, what's that? Uh, uh, can I ask you? Sorry, yeah. just to interrupt you. Can I? Because this, I, this is fun. Because for me, I've never, we've never in the twenty years we've been friends, we've never really spoken about the Smiths. We did a bit, a little bit, but as a, can I put my fanboy, fan, fanboy head on a sec? Please do, Edward. Okay, so <laughs> finally, after twenty years, T. <laughs> Fine. Um, what you it's interesting so you hadn't so with the songs on the queen on uh meters murder when the smiths the smiths came out you hadn't written any of the songs for uh meters murder at that stage they all came in the subsequent touring and that whole period right yeah we wrote kind of as we on the hoof as yeah. we went and yeah. one of the things so that we did was let's write a single yeah let, let's write a second single in between records. Yeah. We, when we, you know, when we finished Meet Is Murder, for example, as soon as that was finished, we wrote How Soon Is Now and Please, Please, Please and what was the other one? And, and William and, you know, yeah. it just, we were like, well, let's do this now. 
Right? But, and there was no like, let's save it for the album. I think because we were just such single freaks as well. Yeah. And it was going right. What we were doing was was going well. I don't mean in a career way. I mean, in fans liked it. And but it was extraordinary it. because I honestly, you know, and I can say this now because I've got my fan head on. I cannot think of another band. And, I, you know, I was, I was hooked in from... My story is, the way I got into the Smiths, I had a very cool friend called Jason Haynes, who had an elder brother called Spanner. And Spanner used to go to the King's Road, and he'd come back to Abingdon in Oxfordshire, which wasn't a very cool place. But Jason, from his elder brother, and so we had a very cool uh, music teacher called Mr. Finlow. And he was one of those guys who like, I think next lesson, I'd like you to come in and bring a, bring a song that you all should, you want, will play and sort of will, will music appreciation. So um, I brought in Straight to Hell by The Clash because I was really into combat rock at the time. I loved yeah. it. Great. Yeah. And I still think that track is genius. The album's really, great. It's, it's such great. It's a great it? album, yeah. It's really, re like the way they absorbed all that New York funk thing and early, you know, hip hop, etc. And then my mate, Jay Haynes, came and he played Back to the Old House. And I was like, what the fuck is this? This is so melodic and so haunting. And then I was completely pulled in. And I think I then saw you, then I saw you on Top of the Pops. But I cannot think, and I bought basically, once I had some money, so it would, it would have been after The Queen is Dead because I didn't have enough money before that. But I bought every 12 inch. You, I haven't told you this. I've got all your 12 inches. And all the, all the B-sides were amazing as well. And for us as a band, you know, Radiohead, because we formed in 1985, you were the benchmark. There was never even, we knew that even if it was a B-side, it still got the same love and attention and craft and integrity and everything that, um, you know, for, uh, there was, I, I, we loved that. And it was, honestly, I, it was, it was, you were amazing for the fans. And it wasn't, you know, it strikes me as a songwriter, it must have been incredible. You were in this incredible purple patch, right? I mean, you continued it on, but I mean, there aren't many people who've done that. Well, thanks. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I had no idea. I, I've known you for 20 years. I knew you, yeah, I knew you liked the band there, but I didn't. <laughs> I've got all the 12 inches from, Mr. you know, Ask. I've got all the, everything, all the, you know. Mr. Finlow. Yeah, Mr. Finlow. <laughs> no, well, but you know, well, I think a lot of uh, Smiths fans knew that we really gave a shit. They yeah. Loved it. First and foremost, they loved what we were putting out and the, yeah. the song spoke to them and they thought we were a band for them. But I think you can hear that there's a lot of, uh, there's, it's not that there's not filler, but everything's intense. Even yeah. the mellow ones are intense. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, well, you know, pretty much everything. You know, there might be a couple maybe if I'm being really, really, you know, serious about it. But generally, it's all, you know, it, Half a Person, which is a really, one of my favourites, is a really dr dreamy, dreamy track. Yeah. Is, it's intensely focused all the way through. There's no, it, when we were, when some of the music kind of drifts by, that was done very, very deliberately, you know? And the sound of Strange Ways, now finally people will believe me when I was saying it, but at the time, it wasn't like it was unfinished because we were splitting up or it. I, I went into that record really wanting to make a record that had more space in it. Yeah. You know, The Queen is Dead is so dense. It's... And I, I love that, that we had the discipline, but even that was intense. You know, uh, like the, our decision to say I'm, what I remember, say I, rem I'm, I can remember every note of, of the music we made. Wow. And, and uh, so on Happy Birthday, I deliberately, the, the electric guitar is just these, these kind of- Love them. Weird, I, 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 they're kind of weird swells like you oh know, they're like, so emotive it's, it's kind so, of like a... it's so, so it's... emotive johnny that 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 guitar those guitar parts i fucking love that song yeah and I, and, I always loved it it's so it, it's so moving it's i i love that song and so you know you have the usual sh you know we you know the usual shit from the from some areas of the press like yeah. you know just trying to uh kind of um, not believe when I said 
uh, that that was all deliberate. You know, I, I was very, very inspired. I was going into that record by the White Album. I was a, really kind of obsessed with the White what, Album. What, in strange ways? Yeah. I was obsessed it... with the White Album, and I was also obsessed with with the Gene Genie. Wow. And, uh, so that's why uh, I started something sounds like Mick Ronson. Wow. Um, yeah. Kind of, yeah. It sounds kind of more like, um, it sounds more like Cracked Actor. Of yeah, what I'm saying. it's so but, interesting because I'm yeah. uh, it, that, about the sound of that record. I because you know your all your albums sounded really different, and I think for me, I mean, I love the sound of all of them. And for me, I always used to think that because you did Meet as Murder, you did at Amazon, didn't you? Yeah, I always thought, yeah, and it always sounded quite 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 trebly, quite kind of tinny, which yeah. was a great sound. But then when you remastered it, you brought out all those other frequencies. But the thing about Strange Ways that I love is the sound of it. It's like, it's like a, it's almost like a classic album sound. And I don't mean that it's like, yeah. ru it's like rumors or it's like, you know, it's got that richness that yeah. is so beautiful. It was Thank that, you. Well, that, that's because we didn't pack it. Right. And, I, I, and that took a discipline. So coming right. back to what, so even when we were being minimalist for us, I won't share you, things like that. Yeah, that that was deliberate. It wasn't yeah. because we because it wasn't because we kind of went that will do. Yeah. You know, it would have been easier if anything to like <laughs> not had the discipline. So we just really cared. We we, we, cared, we 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 cared enough on Queen is Dead say or how soon is now to really spend a lot of time finding trippy sounds, yeah. and then we cared enough on on Strange Ways to to leave it and let it breathe. So it was yeah. always always very careful. Very, very careful and, and uh, focused and uh, deliberate. <laughs> so I'm very proud of all of that. that I, can't, side of it. I can't believe we're having this conversation now because, you know, I'm, I've never been a fanboy with you, like, but Death of a Disco Dancer, like fucking hell. I mean, you know, the guitar on that and the way that it builds and it's, it's just, yeah, the, listen, you know, I'll tell you what was interesting, okay? So you know this. I told you, well, you kind of guessed it and I've, been very vocal about it. you were like i think when i heard your guitar playing for me it was not only a sonic thing which was but it's the emotion and i think that like i completely was drawn in and so you were like as a as a kid who's like 15 years old and who's just picking up a guitar at the first time i'd never heard led zeppelin i never we you know i hadn't heard the stooges it was all about at that time, it was all, I guess my ears sort of pricked up around the time of, I mentioned Andy Summers around the police, kind of his thing, but really it was like McGeoch with Susie, Spellbound, and oh, yeah, amazing. Israel and all that. And we've, amazing. You know, but then it was like, and, there, and it, was, it was you and, and The Edge, and yeah, I kind of think, and Will Sargent as well, which we, you know, I know that yeah. you've been yeah, yeah, up with him. Right. I, hear, I hear that in your playing. Well, I mean, I feel like so blessed because I didn't hear a Led Zeppelin record till I was 28 and I certainly was never going to bend a note, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I feel really lucky that we came up at this time of these, you know, because music was very, very tribal then. Um, certainly yeah. where I was. And you, you, if you didn't have, if you didn't have a, if, if your friends didn't have a Stooges record or you didn't have an older brother or sister with that or a, a Zeppelin record, you'd never hear it. So it was literally what was on John Peel, what was on Radio One. And, um, but my point was, I think what was amazing is that, so I started like following with you. And I remember when you, when the first electronic single came out, getting away with it. Yeah. And I yeah. was just like, oh my God. It's like, it was almost like the most perfect thing. It was like you'd gone to, an, you know, I think what, 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 what you've been, and I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I don't normally do this, and it's slightly weird because we're being public about usually a conversation that we have very privately. But I, it's a nice opportunity. I just think, I just think you've, and you continue to do this. You've got this extraordinary ability for melody and just songwriting. And you know, I, I think, I think, you know, all the stuff you did with the, I was so into Mind Bomb, and then um, Dusk. Dusk. Oh, Dusk was the sound of, for me, was when we were touring around America in 93. But well, it, yeah, that, it, I mean, that's amazing. Well, you know, I mean, that's, you know, um, yeah, uh, you know, to, 
I mean, you get it, Ed. You know, I, you really, I you feel really it. And I think, it, I, think what's, I think what a lot of people get, and I'm so lucky because I understand a bit of the craft that a lot of people, but I think what you do, not only there's so much emotion and, and beauty. I think that's the thing in what you play. There's such, yeah. do you know what I mean? There's such, well, it's. I mean, it's, it's a simplistic, yeah, I, I think when I'm, you know, hearing you so talking that's about. That's quite it, hard to follow. I know that's quite No, no, I understand. No, Ed, what it is, is that there's, to be honest, I think really there's no getting around it that, you know, the, the missing, I guess the missing word, the word that ties it all together, I think, which is unusual, I think, uh, uh, is femininity, really. Yeah. I think, I think I didn't realise I was into femininity in clothes. Yeah. Uh, very much so, because I hung out with girls so much as a kid, you know, like my sister's only 11 months younger than me and we were brought up pretty much, can't really tell us about, maybe till... Until we were about ten or eleven, we were kind of like brought up like twins, and and um, and we we stayed really tight till we were in our teens, you know, thirteen, fourteen, and then, um, you know, when my, all my mates started chasing after it, and you know, I, I, I had to either get rid of my mates so or I had to stop spending less time with them. But she was, <laughs> uh, but her and her friends, you know, that we and I grew up on a, a house in the state uh, that was just overrun with kids. Yeah, it was amazing, and um, so. You know, and, and being a and being in, very interested in girls and and very interested in the culture. You know, like me and my sister at, at uh, 10, 11, 12 were very, very into fashion, street fashion, clothes, and be we got to, go up to people on the bus. Where'd you get the jumper? Where'd you get those yeah. shoes? It's a very working class thing. Uh, yeah. It might even be a very northern thing. Yeah. And um, where'd you get haircut? Strange, but. Um, very important. <laughs> and, um, I think that's uh, quite a northern thing. You know, I always I, coming to Manchester the first time. The thing that really struck me coming from down south, how people get dressed up on a Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's uh, a um, really big thing, isn't it? It's a massive. Well, well, now now yeah. it's happening in the afternoon, which I, so, seriously, if you go out to Manchester on a Friday, certainly Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon, the particularly the girls, it's something I've noticed since the lockdown has eased off a little it's amazing wow. they they are really bringing it at two in the afternoon like it's like what you would normally have seen at 2 30 a.m yeah. eh? or or 11 p.m they look amazing it's it's really amazing it's the thing yeah. i really noticed so but i think um that was part a big part of my personality yeah. a big part of my character and then um um you know uh and I, I, I had to think about it after I got known and I had to, you know, you explain what you're about. But I definitely, um, I thought in 78, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, I, I believe that, you know, one thing that 15, 16 year olds are just absolutely amazing at is spotting bullshit. <laughs> absolutely. Um, that, you that's, know, that's teenagers, what, not, isn't it? They're not as amazing as they think they are, nor was I. <laughs> nor was I, but, but at spotting bullshit in, yeah. in your teachers, yeah. in, in society, in your parents, yep. all of that, they are great at it. And it's, it's a difficult thing to carry around. And I was just going along, absorbing everything about guitar culture, talking like 77, 78, I was 14. And, um, and I just started seeing the regular guys who... the in rock bands, I just thought they were really macho and I thought that was yeah. really, really old fashioned. I'm yeah. not being kind of, you know, right on here. It was just really old fashioned. And I kind of thought that, or, um, you know, I just assumed that it wasn't like, I didn't think I was special in that. I just thought it was old fashioned. And then as I got older and, you know, I mean, when I wrote my autobiography a few years ago, from an adult's point of view, you know, and having grown up kids of my own and stuff, I do see that um, in that regard, you know, my, sensibilities were were um kind of half la lad uh running around as a guitar playing lad but yeah. also some very kind of uh very sort of pro the perry girls uh, uh, they were my heroes yeah in manchester i used to see them and the, they just looked great because they were androgynous see they were half between they kind of look quite boyish yeah and i realized that i could t kind of turn myself into that so that you know but, that was that was a big I, part of what I did, really. I think you were really important. It's funny, but like, 
particularly you guys, were so influential in culture, certainly for me as a teenager. I mean, you were the reason, the Smiths were a good reason why one of my courses at Manchester University was feminism, you know. And yeah. I think it was a brilliant time because there was a, you kind of exuded that. And it was really quite weird. I found the 90s really fucking weird because so, when the whole lad culture came back, and I was just like, because I remember as a band that sort of came back and we certainly weren't part of the kind of like loaded and nuts magazine brigade. And it was so weird because I thought, I thought we'd done that. I thought that went out years ago. That's, yeah. like, ben, that's like Benny Hill. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Back in the yeah. 70s. And I yeah, thought there was, and... it was like this huge regression in the 90s. We'd kind of, you know, feminism, it was interesting. When I studied feminism, it was really hardcore. It was fascinating, but really hardcore in the sense of, you know, hardcore feminism, which is, I can't even remember a lot of it, but I remember being, wow, this is, um, it was very 80s. It's very 80s, like full on kind of um, uh, sort of, I wouldn't say the Derek Hatton of feminism, but do you know what I mean? That kind of extreme version. Hardline, yeah. Really hardline, kind of like basically women should get rid of their, should have mass hysterectomies because, re, you know, reproduction and having babies is at the, is at the heart of, you know, oh, yeah. of the, this inequality. So all this stuff. But it was so interesting, like, when the 90s came along, we'd been through that and we cut sort of, and it was, it was really cool, a lot of that 80s stuff. Then the 90s came along and it was like, hang on a sec, what, you know, it's like, it was such a strange thing. I mean, I guess that's what happens in culture. You know, each generation reacts to the previous one. But I don't know if you felt the same thing in the 90s. It was just like, hang yeah, on no, a sec. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, the culture, you know, there was a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for it, you know, politically and otherwise, and everything yeah. got very, the bar really lowered, I think. You know, there's no doubt about it. I mean, luckily now, the younger generation that I'm pretty to, you know, everybody's perfect by any means and, and you can't, okay, I am going to generalize, but you know, what is, what is endearing though now is that the, 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 the concerns uh, of the younger generation now talking, say, you know, people leading school age to mid twenties um, over the last sort of 10 years, they're, um, you know, the rights, gender rights and gender equality, uh, you know, for trans people or whoever, you know, uh, that is entirely uh, a consequence of the younger generation. I'm not yes. saying my generation wouldn't have done that, but we didn't. The, the amazing transformation uh, and the awareness that uh, some people have to get on board with yeah. uh, about gender equality yeah. of all sorts is entirely down to the generation of young people who may be uh, up to th their mid thirties now. Yeah. And it, that is really fucking a brilliant thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they've got a lot, there's a lot of global concerns, a lot of things, but that, that's, they changed the world there. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, lo very lucky that, and I, I guess you are too, that, you know, we still play to several young folk. You know, uh, they listen to our <laughs> records, they come to our shows and, and they interact, you know, and, yeah. um, uh, and you get a vibe. And, and um, I'm very, you know, I'm impressed with the, the times that are more yeah. in that regard, the times are more impressive than what you, you're describing. But to go back to the guitar sound in a way, you know, I mean, it's a long conversation, but um, I was thinking that, see, the Smiths played a few gigs with the Cocktail Twins. Yeah, of course. That's another one, Robin Guthrie. And Robin Guthrie had that down. Yeah. You know, he, he he was a he was a guy who had that down. And and what and, and what Liz was doing vocally and with her yeah. pre her presence. Yeah. Uh, it was you know there were a lot of really there were there were You're right. uh, Robert so Smith. Was, Rob, I mean right. Yeah. I mean Robert's got it in his voice. He's yeah. got it in his guitar playing. Yeah. Uh, you know he's he's a really good, very very good example of. Uh, what was happening on the stage that did represent my generation of, he's older yeah. than me, but yeah. I saw the Cure early gigs. Yeah. Uh, you know, his voice was beautiful. His face was beautiful. His guitar playing. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, and, and I think he stayed true to his, his well, values when you hear his songs, you know? It, yeah, it's interesting because like, you're right. It, it was, was that like, I, the, the, you spread the net wide and there were people like Geordie. Yeah. Uh, Geordie had a great sound. Um, 
Uh, well, Billy Duffy, well, your mate, your pal Billy. Yeah, as you said, well, of uh, course, Billy, but uh, Will Sargent. Book, Will Sargent. Well, Will Sargent was like, you know, the king of the king of 12 string and, and delay and reverb, like making your guitar sound like it's come from the deepest cavern on the planet, you know, on the earth. And Yeah, well, do you know Will's just put an um, uh, autobiography out or it's just about to be out? Oh, wow. That would be yeah. great, right? Yeah, that, that'd be great. And he, he's, that, you know, he's, he's got, he uses one of your sustainer I know. strats, man. I heard. Oh, well, you, you hooked us up. And it was so funny because when he sent me an email, so for people out there, Johnny is a friend of Will's and we sent him, sent him one of my strats and he, he got on with it. And he was, I was talking, cause it was funny. Cause I hadn't, I, you know, he was another one who I was sort of, I, I loved the Bunnymen. I thought the Bunnymen were just, they, it was like they had their own world. The Bunnymen sound was incredible. Um, and he, it was funny when he described his guitar playing or like the kind of sounds that he was after, I was just like, Oh, yeah, I, I totally get that. That's how I, you know. Oh, did he? Know. Right. Did he do what was that yeah, to you? It, was, yeah, he yeah, he said I'm that. Just going to move said, this light, Ed. Just cause yeah, yeah, I've, tr I've had to alter the light. So he was great because it was funny. I, he said something about, I want my guitar to sound like, if you imagine what. I, no, I know what he said. It's something yeah. that I was, I had a, got obsessed with about imagining what music might sound like in space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And And I was definitely, I definitely went through a period of like getting all cosmic and thinking and it's still there parts of it but thinking what what would that sound like or you know um you know how i bang on about that film interstellar that idea of being in space and 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 trying to trying to find a sound that that evokes the feeling of how it might feel in so anyway you know did you um, like the what's the what was the the brad pitt space film what was that oh, i thought that was rubbish ad astra uh, yeah, is that so? Is that not happening now? Oh man, I was so disappointed because Max Richter does the score, and I really like Max Richter's stuff. I think he's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, me too. He yeah. thinks it's good, right? Yeah. And um, and I thought, oh, this is gonna, this is right up my strasse, you know. <laughs> and I think the problem is, I watched it on a flight, which can go either way, as you know, can't it? it? Can either be, can I be weeping about, oh my god, this is the exactly. best thing I've ever seen. Exactly. <laughs> crying, yeah. crying at Dumb and Dumber. Oh my God, this wow. is brilliant! Exactly. <laughs> I, I tell you a funny. Story. I've been on. A, you remember those old days where you you're on a plane and you had the film uh, in the economy class and you have it on the, on the wall at the front of that section. So Radiohead touring in about '94 in America. And we have to do an internal flight. And we're in the back part of the plane in economy, and they show. And you wouldn't have equated. Radiohead with the film Dumb and Dumber, right? Especially at that time, serious young men. Intellectuals. Remember, yeah, intellectuals. We had those those funny old headphones, you know, the plastic things that you put in that have the base of the tubes oh. that go into the, <laughs> yeah. that go into the arm. There's Dumb and Dumb over there, and I am laughing. I'm 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 laughing so much, and I'm trying to hide it. And then I look across, and there's Tom in hysterics. There's Johnny in hysterics. There's everyone in hysterics at Dumb and Dumber. So anyway, I've slightly digressed. Is it good? It's, Do you still stand by that? I, well, I haven't seen it since that flight back in 1990. <laughs> I was right. I'm going to have to watch it now. <laughs> I, I, it might, I, I, no, it might not be. It might, anyway. But um, no. So what, are you, what are you up to? Let me ask you. Are you yeah. Is your, so is your, uh, is, is your, your intention now is you're not, you've got, not got book, gigs no, booked. Or I can't sell no everything. Touring. With with ELB. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna go out touring this year, but I cancelled it because I felt um, I didn't feel I was in the right space. I I was I was I had that feeling which I I was I was completely honest with myself, and I I was just like I'm dreading this. I'm absolutely dreading this. And you know you know better than me. That's no way to go out there on tour. You have to be you have to be yeah. Carrying the carrying a light, you've got to have a fire in your belly. You've got to yeah. be wanting to engage. And I was, I, I just, I, I got depressed. I got, I fell into a hole that I hadn't been in for a long, long time. And so, I talked to the managers and I said, I don't think I'm ready for this. And I, and the way that what I've done is I'm basically reframed this next year as kind of, as a kind of, people might call it a sabbatical, you know. But the idea is no pressure. 
and I'm just gonna, you know, I told you a little bit, I'm, go, I'm trying to get more into, I'm letting go of a load of shit. I'm get, letting go, I've realized that the way that I've been programmed is not sustainable. And so I've been doing a lot of work, a lot of inner work and um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. And, and, and it's funny because I think for me, it's like, you know, like you said, teenagers are, um, you know, they, they're, they're the biggest bullshit detectors. I find that with music. And, yeah. and for me, that early part of the year when I was really in a dark place and I was doing the music, but I was just not connecting with it. And the music was telling me, you're, this isn't, you're not going to connect with this unless you change unless you d something's not right here. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I'm thankful I've been through, I'm, I've been through a dark night of the soul, like many people. And do you know what? I'm really no self pity because I actually think these, these are, these are really important moments and you have the choice in life. And I'm very, I know I'm very lucky because it's not like I have to hold down a nine to five. It's not like I have to go to work to feed the kids or, you know, I'm on benefits. I mean, I'm very lucky because I can completely immerse myself in it in the way that not, not through what I, I can do the work. I've got time to do the work and I, yeah. I know, I know what I have to do and I have to do this. So that's what I'm doing. But what's interesting is I'm sort of doing music, but I'm not doing music as a sense of, Oh, I've got to have a song or I'm going to record this. It's more a sense of this is what's coming out at this time. And there's yeah. no, do you yeah. know what? I put, I put so much weight on the music. I put so much weight on everything that I've done in the past. And I'm just exhausted with that. And I'm trying to get to a place where I now flow more. And yeah, I'm not yeah. like, and I'm not judging it by like, shit, is this, you know, I, I just, I, I can't do it anymore, Johnny. I'm, I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's uh, all these different this aspects of the, the creative you know the, the the you know the not not dilemma, but you know the the uh, disposition of yeah. You know, the, yeah it's, it is a definitely a disposition. I had it as a kid. I had a song on the on the, my last album called The Comet, and I had this tune, and it was a a you know I really liked it. It was a sort of effortless which, which one? Well, day in day out is an yeah, effortless right. kind of effortless kind of pop tune, and yeah. I really I loved the melody, and and I had it all, and it was all rocking, but it was driving me absolutely crazy and um really really driving me nuts and i was like this is this is even kind of like a pretty straightforward tune and why anyway every every bus stop every every road sign i went past you know you know is is that the, is that the title is that the title yeah <laughs> ashton on mersey i know, you know it's chill well uh, <laughs> siren sister uh, what rhymes with just man driving yeah. myself crazy and every morning i'd be like nope I didn't get it last night. I didn't get it. And then one morning, and he's really driving me out. And I just went, I kind of went, it, it's just, it's day in and day out. And I kind of went, there you go. Write the song about <laughs> being crazy with this, this, this personality you've got. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, Neil, our friend, Neil Finn is pretty good. He, um, he's not bad, is he? He's not bad. Uh, <laughs> that song, that song that we we played in Seven Worlds, driving me mad. Yeah, I thought it was such a clever song because you could look at that and go, "Oh, it's a song about not being able to write a song." Well, for a non-song, it's pretty good, you know. And um, he, he, that song about the the torment of this thing you're describing, Ed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I hope you know. I you know one thing. Have you ever seen? Um, Francis Ford Coppola, the documentary to the heart of darkness. I love it. It's, it's called Heart. That will make you feel, that will make you feel better. <laughs> I got Susan with with the iPhone out there filming me now. <laughs> exactly, she's just hearing you, just like you're gonna be kicking the dog, <laughs> like hitting the kids. <laughs> oh. It's so good, isn't it? It's so good. It's just, in fact, I mean. It's funny. I pr actually prefer it to the film. That film yeah, I used to too, love as, yeah. as a kid, but as you get older, it's kind of. Um, I'm gonna. I want to just ask you something because uh, sure. I've only I've only got one note. Have you seen? I completely digress here. Have you checked out on uh, on Apple TV the new uh, Asif Kapada um, documentary series, 1971? No. Oh my god! Wow. 
So wow. you know, as, you know, he did the Amy Winehouse yeah. and the Senna. I mean, I, I love the, mar the everything he's done is brilliant, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He so is, yeah. he's he's done this series called 1971, and we're about seven episodes in. They're an hour each, and it's about that year and music and politics. And holy moly, I mean, I've the amount of albums that came out in that year that are just Elton John does a a bit of a, you don't see him, but he's a talking head. He said, the incredible thing about that year was there would have been about 10 albums a week that would come out that were classic. I mean, wow. he might have been over-egging it slightly, but at least there was at least two, one or two albums every week that was released. That, you know, you've got, you've got uh, Hunky Dory, uh, obviously you've got What's Going On. I mean, it's an unbelievable year. Uh, Sly and the Family, there's a right go. I mean, it's, I'm not, it, John Martin, I mean, and it goes into, it's got, it's good because it, 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 it flits over, it's sort of transatlantic, so you get a bit of Bowie, obviously, and a bit of, I love, you'll love the, the, the Mark Boland stuff. Yeah, the, the yeah. The T-Rex yeah. footage. Yeah, right, um, right. But then you go across and how it's kicking off in America with the anti-Vietnam movement. And you know what struck me? It's really interesting. So last night we watched a couple of episodes and one was, sort of almost dedicated to, you know, do you remember Angela Davis, who was the... Sure, yeah. 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 And I was watching that and I was going, Susan and I were going like, I mean, I knew about Angela Davis, but I didn't know about the detail, you know. No, I me neither, no. But the, the thing that struck me watching it was like, why weren't we learning this at school? Why, why were we learning about Henry, Henry VIII and his fucking six wives? Yeah. And it's honestly, it's enough to make it, it's enough to make you conspiracy theorists when you start thinking about it. Are we deliberately? I really think that that they deliberately keep this really interesting but topical, relevant part of our recent history out of children's syllabus because it gets people questioning the status quo. Hundred percent. They, they, in the in the England, I mean, certainly when I was a kid, it, did you go to a Catholic school? No. Uh, well, in Catholic school, it's even more so. Everything ends with, and that's why this person is a martyr. Uh, uh, and then, and then that's why this person became a saint. And you're kind of like, what? Uh, America, this is me at my 12. What was, America had a civil war, right? I'm, pre I'm pretty sure I've heard the words yeah. of the American civil war. Miss, miss, <laughs> sir. And, uh, you know, it's like, well, was, uh, did someone get hung, drawn and quartered for, for the Lord? Then you're not, then you don't need to know about that. Yeah. And, and certainly, you know, again, I, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I kind of, it was, it's again, it's one of those things when I wrote my book, I, I, um, I thought that writing about my school days, this high school days was going to be really quick. You know, because yeah. you did because that happens when you're writing a, a, a book, an autobiography. You 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 think, oh, this bit's going to be tough. Uh, I need to ask around, ask my family about what happened here, and I've got to get this right. And you know, this well, you should do that when you go into it. That's what I did, and I just thought, oh, you know, when I get to do the bit about high school, that's going to be kind of a breeze. I'll tell some stories about you know getting a getting a chalk duster thrown at me and meeting Andy Rourke and and bunking off and all will be well and when I actually sat down I, I ended up getting really quite angry I yeah. realised I was harbouring this kind of resentment uh, and that was one of the reasons that was the, the history the lack of the agenda yeah which I, I put down to a really a social agenda yeah well, certainly, I... certainly when I was a kid I think times are different now I, I wouldn't know but for us yeah I mean well that 1971 sounds really right my street i can't wait to check that out i mean i, I watched the, um, you know the lockdown thing we've all been watching lots lots of television and uh but i watched ken burns vietnam oh wow series. oh I wow seen that. really it's the best yeah i mean I, I saw it when it came out but it oh man it's just really incredible as one might expect and the ken burns jazz series is really good as well mm. uh, particularly the like the late 60s stuff but um, yeah, that, that's a really fascinating time that, you know, the American, well, you know, as well, uh, I watched, I found myself, something came up on my timeline and I watched, when you were, when you were, probably when you were younger, the rock and roll years, right? I love, used to love that on BBC too. Half yeah. Half. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I saw a, 
I went on 1975, 76 when I was a little kid. I watched that and the bombings in this yeah. country on the mainland. Yeah. The the hostages, the hijacks, the the uh, insane, uh, uh, arrogant unaccountability of the government. I was thinking, wow, this rings a lot of bells. <laughs> did and, you? Um, did you? It's interesting because the whole Irish thing was like a massive thing when we were growing up, and you obviously. Your parents were Irish, but you were living in, you know, a big Irish community, right? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Because it was weird for me. I, you know, my grand, my grandparents are Irish, and my, I grew up in a household where my dad was like, very, very, very. You were, you were known you were Irish, and um, obviously having an, as a, an Irish surname. But it was really interesting because I'd grown up in very, very white middle class Oxford. You felt like a pariah with an Irish name. And there were no kids at my school. Like, it was a Church of England school. No Catholics. I was like a Catholic. But there was... And I had this conversation. It was interesting because, you know, I don't know if this was... A, was this a similar experience for you in Manchester? Or were there so many of you that it was like, well, you know, that wasn't an issue? No, I, uh, I didn't carry it around. But um, you just got used to it. And also, it was sort of probably 10 years up. So probably 10 years before the... So, yeah, I got, you know, I got, I just kind of took it for normal that some people were going to call you an Irish pig. I got called an Irish pig by a teacher once. And it was a teacher that I thought I liked. Wow. And that really, that was heavy. That was wow. very, that was a heavy thing. And um, I got beaten up at school. But when the Bobby Sands thing was happening, someone, you know, and it was like, you know, the propaganda that was even on the, the news. And it was just like the way it was portrayed was like these guys were like scum right when they yeah, were they was, were political prisoners yeah and I, yeah, remember... I know my, my parents when something kicked off my parents are from southern ireland and who aren't uh a political particular yeah. p particularly and certainly not radically political yeah uh, and just got on with everybody and were very much respected and just got on, got, on, got on with life you know i think I, I think, you know, it affected them a little bit when there was when there was a yeah. lot of stuff kicking off, yeah. But, but, you know, it's interesting. I had this conversation with a guy, the only other Irish guy I knew came from Oxford, a guy called Colin Graney. And I said to Colin a few years back, because he used to cut my hair, and I said, and we were talking about this, because he came over from Limerick in, like, 78, 79 to Oxford. And, and, and I knew the answer to the question I was asking him. But I said to him, I said, because obviously by the end of the 80s and the 90s, it's all changed. And that's not just because of the peace process that came later. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, I said, what was it that started? What was it that changed it? And he said, he said, he said, well, I'm not a fan of the band. He said, but you too. And I said, I remember that as a, as a fan. And also I would say also because going to a U2 gig in like 1984, it was the first time there was a sense of pride in something Irish and you know, you'd see the trickler at a gig and it wasn't like a pro IRA thing. It was like, it was tapping into this kind of lineage of Irish. I mean, I think the Unforgettable Fire is like, it's like Irish spirituality. It, it's got, it's got feelings, I think, when you read Seamus Heaney and stuff like that. But also I would say that you and Morrissey, because of your obvious Irish names, there was this whole, like what you did, the music kind of really made it a very positive thing. And suddenly, like, you know, all the kids at school who were like, who were sneering at you because you've got an Irish name or like, you know, whatever. They, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, you two are fucking great. Oh, yeah, I love the Smith. You know, it, and, and I, I think it played, I think you two particularly played a really, really important part in that. Yeah, um, I think from, from what, I think you're right. You know, they were really, of course, a massive part of it. I think that somewhat not long after that, I think, uh, what Roy Keane was doing with the Irish, uh, yeah, the, and the Irish football team. Totally. Team. Well, the, the 1990 World Cup, that yeah. Irish football what, team, it was yeah. amazing. Jack Charles. Yeah, and the, the vibe. I mean, now you mean that Irish are just yeah. like, proud. I mean, they're always be proud. But I mean, I just on the stuff that I follow over the last few years, you know, do you know. Well, I think I might have sent you a link to the, the Blind Boy, Blind Boy yeah. podcast. Yes, yeah, great. He's a really interesting guy. He's very, yeah. very talented, very funny, uh, uh, you know, very evolved. What you, this is someone who's evolving all the time, very informed and 
open and a good good advert for a young not just Irish men, young men. You know, he's, yeah. he's a uh, you know I, I really rate him. And then of course bands wise, Fontaine's DC. Great. He, he, you know, wow, what's there to not like? They're great. Yeah. Uh, I'm even hearing that. I think they've recorded even the third album now. Yeah. You know, I mean, the second album came out really quick. Yeah. So, you know, um, just very happening. But I always thought Ireland, for me, I always thought Ireland was dead cool. I always had a kind of, on, I think it was uh, Hatful of Hollow, I, I scra scratched Ian, which is my little brother, and Air, E-I-R-E. -E -E. Yeah, nice. as, as, a, as a kind of like, as a declaration that the Smiths were proud of our Irish, Irish roots. It was my, my kind of thing, really. And it's informed me in a, I don't bang on about it too much, but since you know, but uh, um, it it's really has informed me in a, ma a massive way. Why I don't bang on about it? It's, my parents never banged on about it, but yeah. if you grow up around the accent yeah. all the time, you know, yeah. and and the iconography, and um, you, know, you know, I think um, it's you know you can't help but be absolutely ma massively informed by it. And me and my sister, I felt like we were like, um, you know, we were considered by. Uh, you may and some other kids. We were definitely considered for, as being from an Irish family, and I thought yeah. it was great. I thought it was yeah. great. It was still, still I, there. You know? I, it's funny because we're going to Manchester in 1987. Actually, it was just I remember that whole sense of first time living in a big city. Okay, as a student, but I was aware of the Irishness of Manchester of the north. And well, that you was... will because being you know because because of your background as well. Do you know I was thinking today actually Ed, about talking to you, and I, I was I was wondering. I thought. There's a lot of people who follow you who probably aren't quite as aware of how uh, that you lived in Manchester for quite a while and that you yeah. really have got a... Uh, I loved it. You don't just love it, yeah, but you know Manchester very well, don't you? Well, I, what I did was, I mean, <laughs> fanboy head again. Um, I, you know, I went up to Manchester because of the music scene and particularly because of you guys. But I was completely, for me, I fell in love with the romance of the city. So Manchester, you, I, I can explain to everyone else, but you remember what Manchester was in 1987. It was, it was a post-industrial city. No, there'd been no developments. There oh, was, no. you know, no. the, north, the north side and Tibb Street and all these places. And there was, I, I was just in love with the city because I'd wander around and I had a girlfriend who, who, had a, who, had a, who used to cycle and I used to borrow a bike. And so of an evening, we just go and cycle around the centre of Manchester. And like, you know, these, <laughs> these deserted red brick um, warehouses that I just thought there was such incredible, I, I, there was a vibe there. There was a spirit there that I loved. Oxford is Oxford's a very different place. And of course, I'd grown up, I'd been living in the countryside for 10 years, but Oxford was a city of Oxford University. It's not, it's not a real city. It, it, it's, a, it's a town, but it's not a big city like Manchester. No. And no. I just... I was just in awe of it. I mean, I loved, I loved, look, one of the things I love living in a city is I love exploring a city. So when I first moved to London with Susan, we'd go out walking every Sunday and we'd spend all day walking. We'd just meander through the East End or end up on the South Bank or whatever. And it was the same thing in Manchester and I loved it. And, you know, then you couple it with the music scene that was happening and all these amazing venues like, you know, not of every, everyone talks about the Hacienda, which was obviously great. But I love places like, um, do you remember, it's sometimes called the Playpen or 42nd Street. 42nd Street, you sure, yeah. yeah. On a Tuesday night, I was talking to John Robb about this. On Tuesday night, Marky e. Smith always used to be there, but I swear the music was the best. I mean, at Hacienda, it was cool and really good. But, but the, the music on a Tuesday night, the guy would just, it was, it was all over the shop. It was incredible. Um, yeah, so I loved that. I the loved roadhouse it. was the roadhouse was going there. The roadhouse and the international. Um, the inter oh man, the international one and two. Yeah. The amount of gigs I saw, you know, Gil Scott Heron there I, at the international one. You know, half strung out doing a three-hour set. You know, with three hundred people there. I mean, it's I because I came from a city where there were there were no gigs. You know, yeah. you came you came through in nineteen eighty-five. It was the, and and. You know, uh, was it? Yeah, it was 85. May with, of James, 80, with James. With James yeah. supporting. Yeah, yeah. And my girlfriend went at the time and she was completely besotted with you. And she came back and she said, I'm in love with Johnny Marr. I said, ah, oh, right, great. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. She, <laughs> um, but it was, it was, I loved it. And then, of course, 
you know, I get taken to uh, taken to Old Trafford by a friend of mine and stand on the Stretford end for the first time, and I'm like, holy moly! And it could have been Kipax, you know. Did, it could. Did, did you get Did you get work done seriously? Yeah. Did you? No. No. No, because I didn't. It, because you I didn't. arrived. You arrived in. You know, so much is made in this of the sixties, Carnaby Street, sixty-five, yeah. sixty-six, sixty-seven, or Hey Ashbury, nineteen sixty-seven, in in San Francisco, Manchester, <laughs> yeah. eighty-seven, eighty-eight, eighty-nine. A couple of years after when it got milked, was yeah. culturally that busy and that revolutionary. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Eighty-eight was when the nascent real seeds <laughs> of that Manchester thing, and it wasn't just about debauchery. Now, of course. No. Of course, hedonism was a big part of it because it was a youth movement, but also because there was a there was a key new drug involved. Yeah. But, but people who really got into that didn't feel the nature of MDMA and, and it being a communal thing. It didn't feel like it was a hedonistic experience. It felt like the way people talk about LSD in the sixties. It, it it was it was without doubt. I don't want to sound irresponsible here, but the the feeling was definitely of like opening doors for people bringing people together a lot of people who were formerly not very nice got a lot nicer yeah and that was great um obviously and then but coinciding with that was the digital technology i mean you can see in the story of the what electronic started in 88 and we the our very first songwriting session bernard goes to his bag and i'm you know pull my guitar out and plugging in my pedals and he pulls out a Mac Macintosh yeah. SE30. Wow. And that was like such an important member of the band. And this was new to me. I mean, the Smiths, we'd had, we had computerized mixing desks and, and we had the Akai sampler the, on, on Strange Ways. There's a photo inside it that Angie took of me listening to the mix and you can see the sampler in the background. So we were, we were the Smiths were by no means Luddites. You yeah. Know? I, I had the emulator too at the start of last night I dreamt and that was because of Bowie and, you know, all of this business. But um, anyway, so, but the Mac SE30 and uh, that was, you know, um, that was a big part of the sound, not just of electronic, of everybody. 808 Stay, guy called yeah. Gerald. And, but it felt like there was a tsunami behind us. We weren't aware of it until it happened. But what was happening, I can only speak for myself and Bernard, was while we were starting with electronic and while our peers were kicking things around with samplers and um, in studios, uh, there was behind us that we weren't aware of this tsunami of a digital revolution that was about to happen, that suddenly digital synths, uh, 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 DX7s and you know, blah, blah, blah. But within a year, uh, people are uh, making their own flyers, people are producing their own t-shirts, people are, everyone yeah. is dressed the same, but different to the mainstream. So you'd walk around on a Saturday morning you know, everyone having been out on the Friday or on a Sunday, and you just start to see these pockets of people who had radically th the same clothes as you. Flair, 18 inch flares, <laughs> curtain haircuts. Joe and, Bloggs. Uh, uh, all of that, and but we weren't all going, oh, we're all getting fucked up. No. That was down in the pecking order. What that drug was facilitating was this communal feeling and people, um, Doing new, doing new things. It was an amazing, amazing time, and it was in my hometown. Yeah. And I was a dyed-in-the-wool townie, and still yeah. am. You know, I've been grown up in the inner city, and worked there in Saturday jobs and all of that. And it was my, it was uh, sort of basically starting to develop in front of my eyes, and in yeah. my house, and in other people's places, and and then similarly around the rest of the country. Uh, with people like Shume and Danny Rampling and Paul, Paul Oakenfold and, and uh, Mark Moore, S Express and all of this stuff. But, re but Manchester was the place it was... that it all came together. It, there's something about the Industrial Revolution yeah. and something about the university and something about the vibe of the place that, oh, I guess, one word, Hacienda. Well, yeah, it's funny. And I, it's funny. I always used to feel really guilty about, like, I was always trying to play down my student credentials when I was in Manchester, because I didn't want to be, you know, another fucking student. But it was interesting when I spoke to John Robb about it. He was like, no, he said, 
the, the, the amount of students in Manchester is key to help, you know, a scene stay buoyant. And students like, I always thought that, you know, the cool people in Manchester would look, you know, would look down, at, um, you know, not another fucking scene. But actually, John, John Robb explained, it's that actually, no, they were really important because, of course, you know, they spend money, but they also, uh, they're hungry. They're hungry for new stuff. Well, the chemical, I, chemical Brothers met. They Manchester. were there as well. That's Before right. that, the comic strip. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, there's been a sort of, a, you know, there's been a, a, a kind of legacy, a tradition of, of people from outside of the city coming and just digging it so much. Chris Wright, who's, who formed Christmas Chris Records. That, yeah. Yeah, another one, that's right, yeah. Yeah. And the amount of people who I've met over the years who come up, they want a selfie or whatever, and I can yeah. tell, you know, they, they're not from Manchester. And I'll ask, I, I kind of know the answer before I've even asked it, really. What, what you know, why did you come to the city? And yeah. often it's, they come to uni, and they, yeah. they chose that uni, sort of a certain vintage, I guess. They chose that uni because of the O's and New Order and the Roses and, and, yeah. and the Mondays and all of that stuff. Uh, and that's, you know, that's... Uh, I don't know whether that's changing now, but uh, I know Leeds has become like a really, a bit of a hot spot for people to want to go to, to uni, but that's a, you know, it's a different thing. But uh, There was that summer of 19, uh, for me, it felt like every, that summer of 1990 with the World Cup was yeah. almost like the perfect yeah. kind of coming, because that summer was so, it was a hot summer, wasn't it? And I, I remember, I mean, it all, I also remember, I sort of left after that summer, but it also, that's also when it started to get a little bit gnarly. I remember being in, do you remember that club conspiracy? Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember being in conspiracy and being scared out of my wits because the Cheatham Hill posse had sort of stormed in and it was all starting. But there was, it was really, you know, New Order. For instance, New Order did the World Cup song, right? You, yeah. Electronic, getting away with it, just come out, what, at the end of 89? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think when you when you were describing that, it, you know, it, it reminded me that that summer nineteen ninety, when um, you know, one of one of my favourite things I've ever done is um, is is get the message, the the Brilliant. electronic track, and but that that literally, I've had two experiences that as I can remember. One is this charming man, the other is get the message, where I had the window cracked open a little bit, and the warm breeze was coming through the window, uh, which is not something one is used to in Manchester. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I was, I was writing, I was, I was playing the guitar anyway. And, um, and I don't know if you can hear this, but that's yeah. how, how I got that. It, that riff, you know, is to me sounds like the, the warm wind coming through with totally. all... Totally. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. That's okay. So, so you know, without with my that is that is one of the greatest riffs of all time, and I remember because that came out the following summer, right, nineteen ninety one, and for, that was the sound of that summer, and it was a, it was, it was just a cool. It could have been like in nineteen sixty seven. It could have been the summer of love. It it captured everything about that time. Well, totally. I, yeah. Well, I had the the riff happened and the sound and the twelve string. And I was kind of like, I was just re I didn't even think about it, but I was remembering that I really liked the family stand, Ghetto Heaven. Yeah. Oh, I love that track. Well, that kind of, that space, that, that was what yeah. made me want, I put, and I, I put the song down in 25 minutes, you know, no my own, like the bass line and everything. I was like trying to marry that to a Ghetto Heaven kind of vibe. And, you know, and we, we ended up, not only do I, I think it, the song was a very good listen and particularly what Bernard did on it. I mean, it was like, oh my Amazing. God. He was so good. So I guess, th th really, that I, sh I, should, I should open the window more and, and try and- Especially now, do it tonight, Johnny, it's a warm night. Pray for riffs <laughs> to come through the window. Was that Denise Johnson who sang on that? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, do you know, Denise on that, we wanted her to sing more. And she yeah. said, no, leave it. I should just come in with this impact and wow. do, th do this thing and then leave it. Wow. It, that, that's, that's a real musician. You know? there's, something about, I, there's something about her voice. I mean, you knew her, but like, 
yeah, there's just be absolute beauty and magic in her voice, right? I mean, Denise and I did so, so much stuff together. We, I, I was very felt very fortunate that we really clicked, and you know, on on the electronic second album, which is very kind of housey in a way. Yeah, really, she's the she, on that particularly on the dance tracks. She really gold plated all of the stuff that she sang on. I mean, I, you know, the, I was running out of tracks back then. We recorded on tape. And, you know, we would have needed three studios to put the, because we just kept piling on, me and Denise were encouraging each other. Yeah, that was a, that, yeah, I'm really, I've, yeah, I feel very lucky that, uh, that I've got a voice on a couple of songs that I wrote, you know, so it's a beautiful, beautiful. thing. I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of that, Ed, yeah. Uh, that's, I love, you know, and I love the fact that you're playing, you, you, you see, you, when I saw you play Get the Message Live. I wanted to do that for the longest yeah. time, and for so, I always thought it was going to be, um, a real task and I thought we would need other te more technology and maybe a laptop on all this and you know what I, I, I suggest this is true story for years I thought oh it's going to be we're going to need five more band members to play this song for some reason and I mentioned it to my band and I went and was doing something in, in rehearsal and I came back and they, they were playing it and it sounded like it does wow. wow that's how good my band are the three of them they're great. I mean, they're really likewise, great. Ed. Likewise, man. That's why, you know, your band. So yeah, good. They, I, miss, so good. I miss those. We only did six shows. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. We'll be back. How long did you yeah. rehearse for? We did, we did two weeks out in Wales, we, where, where I did a lot of the recording. We basically, because I didn't want to, I, I kind of wanted to imbue them with the spirit of the record. I, I'm really into all that. You know, I'm really into, a yeah. bit like, you know, very similar to when we went out to, uh, carry carry or rehearse at Piha with Neil in the first Seven Worlds Collide. Getting them people into a place that's not in the city, where we kind of eat, eat, sleep, and breathe it, and um, and it was good. It was really fun. But you know, it's funny. It's a whole other conversation. But um, yeah, I miss those guys. I'm, you know, and it's uh, but it feels like a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, there's Seven Worlds. Well, Seven Worlds particularly. Oh, oh the band. The, oh, but the band Seven Worlds but, yeah. was a long time ago. Seven oh, the Worlds band. Is... Yeah. Do, well, you know, hey, look. Uh, yeah, exactly. The thing with lockdown, um, someone I know the other day, just in conversation, was, well, um, said uh, they were talking about just the lockdown. It was just a passing non-conversation. And they just said, uh, they just said, uh, time, uh, time isn't doing anything. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, I think you've just completely summed up lockdown because my experience is that, Half the time I think that it seems like the days are flying by. And then other times I think it seems like years ago that the whole lockdown started. And then I think, well, I've, I've, I've got a whole lot done. I've recorded a double album. And then other times I feel like it was only yesterday and I'm not getting anything done. And this phrase, uh, time's, not do time's doing nothing. Yeah. is like, wow, that's so pretty zen, you know. Uh, and it seemed to sort of cap... I think that's what she said anyway. And I think it sort of um, it seems to kind of sum up this sort of worth feeling of kind of uh, suspension, you know, this sort of feeling of yeah. like sort of suspended kind of time, you know. I mean, obviously, we, you know, you're an asshole if you're not, a, if your thoughts firstly don't go to, you know, people who've really, really had, had some suffering. In, uh, uh, and But also so many people are like, you know, sitting on the end of their beds in little apartments in London, you know, and or New York or wherever around the world, and they're working on the end of the beds, you know. Yeah. And that's, it's going to be so good when this is all over. People yeah. can just get out and, and remember, just get back to remembering just being ordinary, you know. Yeah, yeah. Unextraordinary, know. you know. Like yeah. Just, just mundane stuff, you know. Yeah. So, and That's I think great. I, I think people as well. I think if you know if you're tr if you're looking for silver linings, there's. I just hope that people are going to. Oh, well, I was just about to say I hope that people are going to be kinder to one another, and I think some will. Yeah. And you know more appreciative. There's obviously there's obviously some who aren't, but um, yeah. I think Thank human you. nature is such that um, what I think this is almost like kind of something about this is kind of endearing. I think human nature is so, so, such that about a year later, people are just going to kind of, not for, have forgotten it, but 
But the people yeah. who are who are the fortunate ones of us who haven't lost our businesses or yeah. haven't suffered losses and all of that, there's going to be a lot of people who just kind of remember it as a weird thing that we went through because yeah. not because they're um, unfeeling because we're just humans are such creatures of habit. Yeah. And once we yeah. get back to doing, and I think do you know what, good, good for people. You know, we don't be want to be carrying trauma around. Good for them. You know, good for people to shake it off and yeah. get back to get back to all our moaning. <laughs> <laughs> on that note <laughs> Johnny it's been great I, to see you Ed. it's been great I mean I know that we, we it's kind I, of hang on a second are people listening to this well <laughs> yeah sorry usually, usually our conversations the last the one we had two weeks ago went on for three hours wow fa fantastic I love right. them I really I always love checking in with you because likewise yeah I always course. feel uplifted and I always you know Great that, to have mates, yeah. man. It's great to have mates. Exactly. Mate. Yeah. Love you, Ed. Love you, Johnny. Take have care, a beautiful man. evening. Speak to you soon. Thanks very much. See you. See you.